Starting your own practice is hard for many chiropractors. It's riddled with both struggles and successes. But here at the Chiropractic Philanthropist, we make it easy by having chiropreneurs and entrepreneurs share their struggles and lessons learned in life and business so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. And now, here's your host, Dr. Ed Osborne. How amazing would it be if you could practice because you want to, not because you have to? Learn how to improve your cash flow and increase your passive income now. Go to moneyripples.com or find their podcast, The Chris Miles Money Show, to learn more. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. This is Dr. Nima Romani's. I went back and looked at past podcasts. This is your fifth time on this show. Really? Really? You did three three podcasts in 2015 when you were trying to transition out of being a full-time chiropractor. My gosh. Then you did a a follow-up and actually I went back and look at some of the titles because I wanted to make sure that I please let let's let's go down memory lane (laughs) okay so uh back in 2015 uh early part of the year January you were chiropractor turned edutainer I remember that guy (laughs) I'm just it's like the artist formerly known as Prince it's exactly. like one of those, one of those, oh, I remember him, 2015, my 2015 version, totally. Right. Yeah. And then as you move through that, uh, you started the overview method. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. And I took Dr. Ed through a little session on, on the show. I actually yeah. took him through a process on the show. So uh, amazing. Yeah, that's cool. That's okay. The, that's the second time. Keep and going. then in, in 2019, you had started um, doing emotional baggage and toxic relationships. Yes, because I was in the midst of one at the time. <laughs> it's, we teach what we need the most. <laughs> because we Isn't teach, that? We teach what we need the most. And I was knee deep. I was knee deep in untangling from a trauma bond at that time. Wow, little did I know what I was in for. At that FYI. In that time, around the time that was released, my ex that was kind of, I was untangling the trauma bond with, filed a police, uh, like filed a police report against me because we had a really volatile relationship. And there, sometimes I'm so ashamed and embarrassed to say it got actually physical. Now, it wasn't like crazy physical, like, R. Kelly, uh, you know, like the, the the crazy, like the crazy ass type of stuff. But, it, you know, situationally, there was two volatile people. It was abusive, both of us, verbal abuse and emotional abuse and manipulation coming from her side. And then I just would lose it. And then, you know, one time it was 2018, March of 2018, I slapped her in response, in retaliation right. to it, to, to, to feeling so threatened. Now, I'm not, I'm not proud of that time. I'm not proud of what I did at that time. However, it sent me down through a process of understanding codependency, relational dynamics, uh, unpacking it all. I didn't know what narcissism was. I didn't know what codependency was. I didn't know what cluster B personality type disorders were. I didn't know what trauma bonds were, but I was just unpacking that. And then Whatever this is my commitment is who I am is I teach what I most need to learn. I integrate what I, the lesson, and then I, and I deliver it kind of in a vulnerable way. I say, Hey, this is what I've learned for anybody who's maybe, you know, I'm not on any mountaintop. I'm not a guru, but I might be a few chapters ahead in, in the book, uh, in life. And so this is what I learned. And so at, so that was 2018, we both healed together We did the work, but then I did the most unthinkable thing, which was to leave. And when I left that really, this is why people stay in toxic relationships. It's not, it's not the relationship itself that they're afraid of. Oftentimes it's the consequences of leaving. And I knew that because of her kind of dysfunction and her abandonment wounds, if I was to leave, I was afraid. I was like, is she going to like 
go ballistic on me? Is she going to turn psychopathic? Is she going to, you know, because I was very open with our community. I was like, Hey, this is what happened to both of us. We're both taking ownership and responsibility. Let's heal from this. And this was our path. And after about a six months to seven months, I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be with this person. And when I left, that's when she filed a police report years after the incident. Oh my gosh. It was a couple of incidents throughout our four years together. She files the police report. And at the time I didn't know it was happening, but I got married from all the work that I did. I really was able to find a, a secure relationship. I got married. We have a baby. And a week after my son was born, I was arrested. I was what? arrested a week after my son was born. And like charged, cuffs and everything? Cuffs, back of the police car. I was dry, dry. I call my wife from my lawyer's office. I'm like, babe, I'm, I just got arrested and I don't know what's going to happen. And that was uh, September of 2020. And for two years, I was under criminal investigation for assault, of which I was like, I'm going to plead guilty. Like I, I did, I I did do it. We got over it. We healed. I did all of the stuff. Uh, Like I'm going to plead guilty. uh, So let the chips fall where they may. And in June of 2021, last year was my sentencing where I had the opportunity to you know, plead the case and, and the case was, was, was going, going, uh, in front of the, the court, the criminal court in Vancouver. And, uh, the, the, the judge turns to me and says, okay, something I don't understand. I hear this whole thing. Why is it that a chiropractor who helps heal people, who has all of these amazing critters, never, no record of anything ever has all these letters of recommendation, even from my ex-wife. How is it that he can, you know, behave in such a manner? And I was like, you know, your honor, I've been trying to figure that out for the last four years. And it's resulted in something really, you know, with, with every, every cloud has a silver lining. And the silver lining was, I now get from an embodied perspective what a trauma bond is. I didn't understand trauma bonds. I didn't understand cluster B personality disorders, how they manifest. I didn't, I didn't know, understand boundaries. I didn't know what enmeshment trauma was, but I was involved in a toxic relationship with somebody because her childhood woundings were a perfect match for mine. And we would activate each other and we would be abusive to one another. And when the verbal threats and the attacks and the manipulation would come, I would lose track of my prefrontal cortex. I regressed to the little child and I reacted like little children do. And now I understand why it happened and exactly how to tame that behavior, how to uh, palliate that behavior and trigger proof was born. And now I have a community of, at the recording of this, of over 12,000 people where I teach people exactly how to avoid this toxic dynamic at its root and help when people are in these toxic relationships with narcissistic abuse or whatever, how to get the fuck out. Because you're like, in my case, Staying in was just self-preservation because God knows what they would do. When I kind of pulled away, there was massive retaliation, smear campaign, police reports, all this. All of a sudden, the story got twisted. And now I'm the abuser and I'm the, uh, you know, uh, the, the narcissist. And I, I, she suffered brain injuries. And all of a sudden, these accusations are coming. I'm like, where are they coming from? And I told the judge, I said, I totally understand now. And uh, I've been able to heal and now have a really beautiful relationship. And I'm a father now, and I've broken the cycle. And the, the judge basically said, I've never heard such insight from somebody. And I'm like, you're never going to see me again. But, you know, so uh, <laughs> I was thinking that I, I didn't get to say it. But then right. she basically said, OK, so as long as you continue that path, no criminal record, no nothing like that. 
And so I got a uh, conditional discharge and I've been teaching, I've been telling my story and the concept of how to break free from these toxic, should I stay or go codependent trauma bonds that are volatile, where people are willing to take ownership and responsibility for their part, like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And well, Johnny took responsibility, but Amber <laughs> didn't and, and healed from that. And, uh, and so that 2019, as you're telling me, 2019 was the last, w- w- was the third one that you said, but yeah. how to heal from toxic relationships. I was knee deep in it. And wow, that, that version of me was super duper terrified. I, I, I felt, oh, relieved that she was out of my life. But little did, she, did little did that guy who who did that recording. If you're if anybody's listening to that recording, that version of me didn't know what was coming ahead of him. Didn't know that he was going to be arrested, and made you know. And so if that's what she felt she needed to do, okay. I didn't fight it. I didn't go through a trial. My lawyer was like, "This is bullshit." You, you know, there's, there's yeah. all the, you know. I was like, "No, no, no. I, I'm owning it." I want to take full accountability, whatever happens. And so uh, that happened. And then the next part, which is the um, family court case, she's suing me for spousal as well. So the, the financial abuse and the legal abuse is now happening. This is still, and it's now been five years and I'm still in the unpacking and unwinding of the trauma bond. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching people how to spot the red flags, how to become a healthy soul and rewire the pattern that got us into that toxic situation. That's why where rewire trauma, sex, and money came in because she was a sex worker. She was a former former sex worker, uh, former um, exotic dancer turned madam. And I was like, wow, I think she would be great to run my company and partner with for four years. <laughs> Help me run my company as an independent contractor. And I was like, this would sounds like a great idea, but it was all because of my conditioning with trauma bonding, sex and my my sexual shadows and money, because it was like I had this fantasy and she was going to of being rich and famous the edutainer, the 2015 version of me, was going to be yes. rich and famous, and she, I was going to use her for to help get me there sexually, and uh, and the services, sexuality right. to get me to that narcissistic supply, and I was her ticket, her meal ticket out of that dark world. So we were perfectly trauma bonded for this toxic situation, which is now with the gift of this sentencing, I can tell the story and not worry about getting in trouble uh, because I was in secrecy, silence and shame about it for so many years. Holy shit, I gotta say. How you doing? So how you doing? (laughs) (laughs) That is an incredible story. It's the truth, it's the truth. Wow. On the recording I, of this, the family trial is happening in two weeks. So it begins yeah. in two weeks. So that's the final piece of like what it takes to heal from narcissistic abuse. What it takes when you choose to let the wrong person in your world because you're addicted to a fantasy, watch out, you're paying for it later. And so I'm taking all these painful lessons. Yeah, yeah, and integrating them, and I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about teaching it in a way where other people can keep that cycle of love bombing, devaluing, discarding, love bombing, devaluing, discarding. This cycle of abuse, I've lived. I've been on both parts of it. I was a, I was predator, and I'm prey. I was abuser. I was the abused. And so I have a very interesting lens of this whole dynamic. And now what I do is I just, people who relate to my story reach out to me and they go, that I'm there, I'm exactly there. How do I get out? And I'm like, they're, oy vey, it's not easy. It's not like, oh, three steps and you're done. It's super easy. No, it's the hardest thing you will ever have to do. So you don't wanna do it alone. You gotta have a right guide. 
you know, whether you do it with me or you find somebody that you really trust who's going to walk you down the path, there is a path to healing and it's a spiritual one. It's not a evidence-based one because of all the evidence out there, there, they say you can't break trauma bonds. It's a spiritual path. It's a path of recovery. You know, it's very much an addiction. There's addictions there, money, sex, uh, love, love addict, codependency, love, love, you know, love anorexic, love addict. Like there's so many um, terms for it. And I just basically put it all together and say, it's all about trauma bonding. It's very, very common. It's that push pull dynamic in the relationship. Come close to me, get away from me. There's this one part of you that just deeply is afraid of abandonment. So you don't want them to leave. And then there's this other part of you that's terrified of being engulfed. It's called engulfment anxiety. I'm, I'm afraid of being eaten alive, of losing myself. Well, deep down, it's because there is no self. <laughs> there's no real self. And so it's all because of the wiring from your primary attachment wounds and um, the, the kind of narcissistic codependent relationship with parents causes, let's say, mother to be emotionally detached from dad. There's no sexual kind of connection there. So the mom then leans heavily emotionally on the child, causing the, and take uh, unconsciously really taking advantage of their devotion of the child's devotion. You know, the five-year-old boy wants to marry mom. The five-year-old girl wants to marry dad. You know, that's just how it happens. And if, if a mother and a father are disconnected emotionally with intimacy, they're not having good sex, then that sexual energy unconsciously, even if it's not overt, unconsciously gets downloaded to the child and there's a confusion there and there's this obligatory kind of, I'm going to step in and be the surrogate parent, be the surrogate romantic partner for my, for my parent. And that's where the wiring gets completely fucked up. And that's what happened to me, which led me down this trail where I was arrested. <laughs> so hopefully if somebody is listening, they can avoid an arrest. Then I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, my work is done. I'm really, I'm really happy. I would be really happy about that. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, this, this has been fantastic with you, Doc. Absolutely awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just ranting here. I got so much, no, no. so much to say. <laughs> because so typically, how this process goes is, you know, I would ask you, okay, well, you know, what quote are you living in right now? Like what's your, yeah. and you know, what's going to be interesting is I'm going to go back and look at your old quotes mm. as well, because that would know, be interesting, right? The growth process from oh, where you wow. were to, where, to who you are, who I've become from that edutainer. And that, right. that guy, I'll tell you who that guy was. He was trying to prove to the world. If you're listening to my 2015, uh, at, um, one, I'll tell you who he was. He was trying to prove to the world that his voice mattered. And he was trying to prove that he, to his parents, that he could be successful. So it was like, he had something to prove because deep down he didn't feel like he was good enough. And so that's why the persona, this narcissistic persona of the educate, the, the edutainer, look at me, I'm going to rap and I'm going to, and, and so I was very entertaining. I would do chiropractic rap songs and dance up on stage. And it got me a lot of standing ovations and uh, invitations to speak. And that was fun, you know, and you know, the ladies didn't mind. And uh, <laughs> all of my abandonment wounds and insecurities could be kind of palliated with that persona. And I totally get it. And I'm not, I don't have, I have nothing but love for that version of me now. So right. it'd be, it so, would be interesting to go through that. So what's <laughs> your, what, what is your like, you know, words or quote that you're living in right now? Mm. Um, I'm a, I'm lately have been obsessed with Carl Jung because <clears throat> This journey has had me go deep into what are called my shadows and our shadows are our hidden parts of us, whether they're good or bad, they're, they're hiding in plain sight to others, but they're hiding from ourselves and we don't want those parts exposed. The shadows, you know, they really want to stay hidden. You know, that's why 
you, you know, our ego, it blocks it. Right. So, um, the, the quote that I'm living in now, uh, Jordan Peterson, let me, let me, let me find it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to Google this quote and tell you, cause it's so good. Uh, and I now I, I, I help people, uh, with this exact thing. Um, it's a Jordan Peterson quote. Um, yeah, he's, he basically says, um, he says, the truth is something that burns. It burns off dead wood. And people don't like having the dead wood, dead wood burnt off, often because they're 95% dead wood. <laughs> let me say that again. Let me, let me repeat it. This is, this is the quote that I'm living right now. The truth is something that, it's Jordan Peterson, the truth is something that burns. It burns off dead wood. And people don't like having the dead wood burnt off, often because they're 95% dead wood. Oh my that's God. shadow integration. Right. That's the best way that I can describe what shadow integration is. And this is why it's such a gift for me to guide people through that. Part of me is because I'm a sadistic fucker. You know, I'm a, after all, you know, when you're a chiropractor, you, you know, there's a li- there's gotta be a little sadistic part of you that likes to, you know, uh, inflict pain on others. You have to have a part of you be sadistic if you're being a good chiropractor, because if you don't have that part, then you're not going to dig in and, you know, and really like let them get that therapeutic uh, release. Um, But shadow work is excruciating. (laughs) It's excruciating to look at yourself and see the unconscious game that you've been trying to unconsciously play to get your needs met and go, my God, I'm 95% dead wood. I am so fucking full of shit. And I don't even know it. I can't even see it. Other people can see it, but I can't. And for the courage that it takes people to go on that path of healing and recovery, true recovery and healing, you know, and when I say recovery, people think addictions, but I, I'm not just talking about that. Truthfully, I think we all are addicts in recovery. We're yeah. addicted to the to the uh, external validation, whether it's external validation or a line of cocaine, we have this addiction or, you know, the, it's just what we're, we're addicted to. So we put on these masks that cover the truth, because if you saw the truth of me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't love me. You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't, you would reject me. So I'm going to hide that from you. Hence the deadwood analogy. 95% of me is deadwood. Hey, uh, before I move on to the next one, I have a question about what you just said. Yeah. If if you said, if you saw the truth of who I am, you wouldn't love me. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you find in your work that that's also true when you're looking in the mirror and you're saying that to yourself, if I saw the truth of who I really was, because mm. we, we all put up these <clears throat> facades, yeah, these facades for ourselves yeah. to try to believe we're yeah. like, it's delusional, right? Yeah. It's a delusional yeah. manifestation. It's characters that we create so that we can hide from that, that, that shameful part of us. Um, to answer your question, I can honestly, for the first time in my life, it's been happy, you know, it's been consistent look in the mirror and say, I love that guy. I love that 15, 2015 version who was kind of at the effect of his insecurities and putting on this character. I love that 2019 version, uh, who did that podcast, uh, who was just trying to get out of this toxic relationship and just wanted to teach what he knew at that time. Um, and I love who I've become. And I remember after that relational breakdown, after I got push to the fact to the point where I can actually, you know, slap my, 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 my girlfriend. I remember looking in the mirror and going, fuck, I hate you. I can't like, mm-hmm. like, and I remember this experience. It was like an embodied, and this is what made me kind of deepen and further my training and go into somatic experiencing. I retired from chiropractic. I went into somatic experiencing because there was this feeling of shame that was in my body, Kelly, that it felt like there was somebody who, who took a pencil and stabbed it in my chest and I was hunched over and I, I felt a physiological ache in my body. And I, I now understand that. And I was like, what is this? And I understand it now to be shame. 
And yes. shame, oh, yes. shame is a weapon used culturally, family systems, culturally, cancel culture. You know, we do it as a collective. There's a collective shame that we are all terrified of, that we all carry. Right? Wow, totally. We all carry it, yet we're terrified of it. So hence the masks and true liberation and true love of self can only come with the surrender and diving in and acknowledging and, and, and releasing and integrating all of that shame. And unless we do that, there's no, the work, and that's what the work is. Most of the work, talk therapy, isn't diving into that. It's just telling your side of the story and having your story validated uh, and repeated is a way of reinforcing your story to avoid your shame. That's the avoidance of the work. Most therapeutics are just coping and avoiding the real work. The real work is the deep inner work of facing, feeling, exposing, and integrating the shame. And unless we do, we will never be able to look in the mirror and say, I love you and actually mean it. You'll say it and then you'll have this feeling of like, try it right now. If you're listening, right. if you're listening to this recording, go to the mirror, look in your own eyes and say, I love you. And notice what happens in your body. That's where the truth will come out. If you all of a sudden get this contraction, welcome to the understanding of shame. That, that means there are shadow parts of you that you probably have been hiding, you've been trying to cover up, or you've just been avoiding, or you locked them in the basement and threw away the key and hoping they would never come back. Guess what? They literally live within you. They're in your voice. They're in your eye contact. They're in your posture. They're in your mental health. They're in your physical health. And so integrating our shadows, getting to a place of self-love is the most healing physically and mentally act that we can do. And it's the one thing that we avoid. Right. And so to answer your question, self-love is impossible unless we integrate those shadows. That's That was what my kind of a very surface level understanding of where you're going with that was. And you have an event happening yeah. in March, in March. Yes. It's and for people. Yeah. It's for people who, you know, are <clears throat> finding some truth in, you know, kind of what I'm saying and they see themselves in it and they're not, there's an acknowledgement. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're bad that there's an acknowledgement of some shame that they've been living with. And that shame that we're holding on to unconsciously actually blocks us from receiving great connected sexuality in a committed relationship mm -hmm. and financial prosperity. I've managed to find the link because when it happened, I was just pushing all love away. I was like, I don't want to date anyone because I'm a piece of shit. I don't want, I pushing all finances away because I'm not worthy. And the undeserving and the unworthiness, it carries in our bodies and, and pushes uh, sexual, good sexuality, connected, conscious sexuality, not from an addictive type of intense, juvenile, trauma bonded, like had addicted state, which is how I was showing up in my last relationship, but a conscious, connected, intimate, kind of spiritual connection. That's that's the union is actually uh, connecting, connecting you both to something greater than you, a higher power. Like imagine that all of the sex that I had before was just about bang bang. You know, like you know, it wasn't about this type of thing. I didn't even know it existed. I didn't even know what intimacy was. And finance, finances, you know, we do practice management companies. We do, you know, we do all of the things so that we can build our practices and all this stuff, but we don't go deep enough to examine our sex and money stories. Sexuality is creativity. It's, it's your business, creative ideas. It's, it's, receptivity 
oh my gosh, if I'm holding on to this shame, then I can't receive. So it's for people who are recognizing that they've done a lot of the cognitive cognition type of inner personal growth work, but they've been missing the neuroscientific wiring and conditioning that has kept them pushing love, pushing connection, pushing intimacy, pushing abundance and prosperity unconsciously away, or having those things consume them to the point where there's nothing else except there's no connection in the family system. You know, you're making a shit ton of money and you got all these goals, but then what? There's no intimacy. You don't have any connection. You can't sit still in your body. It's all in our wiring. So it's a three-day event called uh, Rewire, Trauma, yeah. Sex, and Money. Day one is about these trauma bonds, which I kind of go into my story. Yeah. Day two is about you know our sexual shadows. And I go into, you know I'm very upfront about it. You know, my sex addiction kind of led me to choosing that partner and getting involved in that trauma bond. And then money was definitely involved in that. I was her rescuer financially. She prayed, I prayed sexually on her, not like, yeah. not like non-consensually at all, right, right, but it right. was about that. And then she, I was her prey financially. So we become this predator prey type of dynamic when we don't have a sense of balance in our system and in our neuroscientific wiring with deserving, with healing our attachment wounds. And that event is all about integrating it all and healing it. And that's a live event. Are you doing a virtual side to it too? Or it's, is virtual. It just it's, it's, it's virtual. It's virtual. It's virtual. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it'll be virtual and it's three full days. Um, yeah. I'm going to be actually, you're in Edmonton, right? You bet. Yeah, I'm going to be flying to Calgary in the studio to do it there. And okay. um, uh, people are have been signing up from all over the world. And what's cool is there's a VIP version of it where Dr. John Martini is going to be doing the lunchtime uh, uh lunchtime event, lunchtime talk for the VIPs. And we're talking, he's talking about the neuroscience of deserving. Oh my gosh, what an event you put together. Yeah, it's it's literally like the silver lining to all the fucking trauma and like dysfunction and trying to untangle from a real toxic mess. I've been, you know, the real win has been for me that I've been able to have a secure relationship for the first time yeah. in my life, I have a family now. I never thought it was possible because I was always the love avoidant. I was the player archetype. My sexual archetype, my sexual shadow archetype was the player womanizer, not able to commit, right? And so I was like, I thought there was something wrong with me. Turns out there was nothing wrong with me. It was in my wiring. And so once I got that down, I was like, oh, I can, I can actually feel safe and Here's the thing. It's not that I didn't trust women. I didn't trust myself. Always. It I always comes back. I didn't trust myself to have one partner and not fuck it up because I was wanted to, you know, have affairs or sexting or get those intensity needs met. Turns out it's all enmeshment trauma. There's nothing wow. wrong with people that can be healed to the person who's ready to wake up. And so this, this event is for people ready to awaken and ready to break the cycles of intergenerational trauma and to have healthy, secure relationships and have children grow up in homes where the sexual bond between mom and dad is strong so that none of that energy sexually covertly leaks down to them, causing, wreaking havoc in their intimate partnerships down the road. This is what's happened to us so we can break the cycle. And this is this is who this uh, event is for. People who are ready and, to take and, responsibility for that. And, and what dates are that? March 10th, 11th, and 12th in North I America. I think that's going to be absolutely amazing. Absolutely. And I know you've you've got some new uh, kind of contact information set up. Um, yeah, they send me a DM. Yeah. Send me a DM. I'll, I'll give you the link. Anybody who, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you a link with a little kind of special. If there's a, yeah. a chiropractic philanthropist kind of discount, um, 
Beautiful. Would Let's love do to, that. Would love to have anybody who feels inspired send me a DM. Let me know why. Why this? But, but we're only limiting to two hundred people because uh, that's that's you know there's a container of two hundred that we can limit. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Before I let you go, uh, I have to ask these questions Please. because we have to keep consistent. Yeah. 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 Here. Absolutely. And again, I encourage people to go back and listen to the 2015, 2019 oh, ones. Uh, who is your greatest influence of person on you today? Alive or dead? On you right now. Alive right or dead? Right now, I've Who's... just been bowing down to Carl Jung. Carl, Carl Jung. Jung. Carl Jung is oof, what he's done for me, what his work has done, and how I've been able to integrate. Like, it saved my life. It, honestly, I was heading down a really bad road. And had it not been for that incident, I wouldn't have woken up and looked at myself and the parts I didn't want to see. And Carl Jung, uh, his work through, you know, down the generations of other great, you know, leaders whose shoulders I've been standing on, John D. Martini being one of them, I would not be here sharing this message with such an open heart if it wasn't for him. Right. Absolutely. I can, I can tell that like, just like the openness that you shared with us today yeah. is unbelievable. So thank you for that. Um, all right. What's the best uh, advice you've ever received? The best advice I've ever received has been lately has been from myself in my inner work and in my kind of like, neural exercises and inner journey of rewiring that I kind of teach. It's just stay connected to your vision. Well, that's a good one. Stay connected to your vision and keep moving forward towards its fulfillment, no matter what the storm is in front of you. It's just, just stay connected. What's the, you know, boom, you're confronted by something. What's your vision? Just stay connected. Don't give up. Just keep walking towards it. And that just keeps keeps replaying. That's the advice that I keep giving to my future self keeps giving to my current self as I get stuck in, in self-doubt and, um, you know, uh, worrying about what other people think and all of that stuff. When that, when those shadows do pop up, that yeah. advice to myself keeps, keeps me kind of moving forward. I, uh, I really, uh, I always really appreciate it when people that have done a lot, experienced a lot, uh, and are like, you know, uh, from all external um, markers, made it and are successful, and yet they still talk about self-doubt. Like oh, yeah. it's something, right, that you experience yeah. weekly, monthly. Yeah. Is it, is it daily? Here, here's my best, my best advice on that, Kelly, is... Um, the self-doubting part of you, there's a part of you, it's part of your shadow. As we're talking about Carl Jung, the self-doubting yeah. part of you, Kelly, is part of your shadow. Confidence doesn't come from eliminating self-doubt. Confidence comes from walking with it. Oh, I love it. I love it. So it was a huge breakthrough for me where I realized that I don't have to get rid of self-doubt in order to feel confident. I just had to surrender to it. And this is the net, this is kind of like a little sneak peek of the shadow work. Right. Is that I'm not going to get rid of self doubt. It's time to stop fighting it and to surrender to it and just walk with it. And in so doing, confidence emerges. And, and that is that part of your somato work as well, then? Somatic because work? You, yeah. Right. Because you're feeling when correct. you feel, right? Correct. Correct. I feel. Every time I'm about to share what I'm sharing, like this is a really racy topic. It's highly triggering. I'm sure people are quite activated by this conversation. You know, their nervous system's going into fight or flight or freeze response, whatever that is, or they're angry or they're projecting, you know, their rage on me because they they had a, an experience in it. That's it's gonna happen. But as I share it, my self-doubt comes up. I feel it in my body and then I surrender to it. I don't have to run away from it. I bring it along with me. And that's freedom. It's not freedom from self-doubt. It's freedom 
through carrying self-doubt with me and not expecting it to go away. That's what emerges confidence. It's a distinction, isn't it? It's a quite a distinction. Well, and it's approaching it head on rather than locking it in a closet, like you said, right. and just trying to pretend it's not there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Because all of us deal with it. 100%. We deal with this all the time. So, yeah. uh, and, and you're going to be touching on those topics, I'm guessing. Oh, it's weekend. all it's all linked. It's all linked to undeserving. We going, we go into history. Like, why are you, why are you, why are we so resistant or inhibited with sex, with money, with relationships, with the sense of deserving? And it's fucking cultural. Inter- I go into history. I go into like the collective and how whatever you're feeling is not even coming from you. And there's such a lightness that happens when you realize, oh my God, like I didn't stand a chance. My relationships didn't stand a chance with all this wiring and conditioning going on. But the good news is I can change that if I apply neuroscience tools now moving forward, the second half of life doesn't have to be, you know, a a giant kind of experiment. It can actually be conscious and creative. And so that's what's happened. I've now created a beautiful community, a beautiful marriage, you know, where even after having a kid to make sure that the, that the sexual energy doesn't get downloaded to my son, because there's a lack of intimacy between me and my wife, we prioritize that the connection and bonding with one another, it's the greatest gift we can give our children is a strong bond between, a secure bond between the parents. It's, it's oh so God. overlooked. I, I think you're, uh, you're, you're touching on the, uh, the Rosetta Stone of uh, our society right now with regards to their ability to connect with other people and lack thereof. Exactly. We're in a really, the, the species is in a really, yes. really dangerous time. And you asked before, are we the conversation? You're like, what's my legacy? What do I want to leave? I'm like, if I don't teach my son this, how to connect with himself and each other, like every, especially post pandemic, everybody is so fucking dissociated. Everyone's disconnected. So in a disconnected world where everybody relationships are used as a commodity, as a tool to get our needs met rather than, you know, intimate kind of expression of giving and receiving love because nobody knows how to do love. I didn't. Right. Learning how to become better at love is literally the greatest legacy that I can give my son and to leave, to leave the world is becoming better at loving. And that's essentially to rewire the patterns that have us feeling we're not deserving of it in the first place. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. I can't not wait to, uh, to hear how this goes and uh, maybe even be a part of it because I think what you're teaching is crucial for everybody right now. It's not like a unique set. It's not a labeled of, Oh, if you are this, then that fits you. All of us need to look at those skeletons in the past, look at the things that have held us back and move forward with love. Unfortunately, we won't look until we hit a rock bottom place or we have a wake up call. Uh, There's an infidelity. There's a, you know, suicide or depression. There's a divorce. There's an affair. There's a financial collapse. Or in my case, things get physical. We all you know, we wait for a wake up call before we look at those things. And this is an opportunity for people to get proactive and not have to wait. Or if you've gone through one, now would be a good time to maybe look at it. <laughs> to fix. Okay. So people that want to get a hold of you, your latest uh, URL is just drnema.com, right? Correct. Yeah. Or social media, Instagram yeah. at Dr. Nima. Send me a DM, you know, let me know what you thought. And if you have any questions and um, yeah. Just as long as, you know, whether you're walking the healing path with me or, or, you know, it's with somebody else, I do, uh, I do invite you to definitely walk that path. You know, I do hope, I do hope that this message gets to people and they, you know, whether you talk to your therapist about, you know, some of the stuff that came up on this conversation or you, you know, you find a coach or you find a mentor to, to walk that path because it didn't start with you. 
Right. It didn't start with you. It's a collective thing, but it can end with you. And that's who oh. I want to talk to. What a great message. What a great message. All right, Doc. Uh, I'm going to wrap that up. I encourage everyone to reach out, drnema.com, uh, Instagram at drnema. I think the work that you're doing is great for everybody. So I loved having you on the show today and look forward to having you on another show coming up. Oh boy, it, God. Uh, an even <laughs> six pack. <laughs> six pack, wow. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. And a big love to Dr. Ed. I had I had dinner with him a couple nights ago and he he said, you got to reach out to Kelly and say, you know, cause I was catching up with him. Yeah. Um, and he, he was, he's in Victoria and just catching up and he said, reach out to Dr. Kelly and, and, uh, tell him, tell him there's some, some updates for, for the podcast. And I was like, okay, cool. If you want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely want to talk about it. So that's fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you. So you've heard the struggles, you've heard the successes, and this episode is done. But there's still so much more to come and so much more to learn. Head on over to the chiropracticphilanthropist.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive free practice building tips and strategies, including how to market your practice with your very own podcast and so much more. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on the Chiropractic Philanthropist.